I think the best way to start is, is at school. So at school, I did pretty badly academically. So uh, there's something about the way my brain stores information that is kind of broken. Um, so art was the thing. So I liked art and I liked writing stories. Um, did an art course, uh, got very interested in video editing, uh, then did a graphic design course in London. So I moved from Bristol to London and met some great people. And I think relating to careers, that's kind of, I think those people are more important than the qualification I got, you know, it's making those mm -hmm. connections. Um, and left the, with the college with the graphic design course thinking that I wanted to do video editing. And then a friend of mine got a job at a video games company, and this is around 1993, and uh, said, why don't you come and work with me as a level designer? So I did that and I started work on a Wolverine game. There he is. Oh, and, uh, and, oh, and by the way, I have, a, I have a son who's 12 and his middle name is Logan, which I like oh, to do. That's, that's glorious. And I didn't sneak that in. Like my wife knows exactly what that means. So. <laughs> anyway, um, and yeah, so I started working there. And then immediately after I started there, uh, I also, oh, hello, Mary Claire. Hi. Um, I started doing stand-up comedy. So I started doing that part-time. And at that time in London, you could go and do stand-up at any number of rooms above pubs and rooms behind pubs. So I did that for about 10 years. I got completely hooked on stand-up, um, kept doing the level design. I worked at, uh, that was a company called Bits. I then worked at Argonauts. Um, and then I thought I'll do stand-up comedy full-time. So I left full-time employment and became a stand-up comic. And... That was good. I did that for a couple of years. And then my partner, who I'd, I'd moved in with uh, quite rightly after a couple of years, said, so what's the plan with the whole <laughs> stand up thing? What do you, and of course, there'd be no plan. Um, so I, I stopped doing stand up and I was a bit down about it. But I thought I've done that. Now I know that's you know, that's that's what happened. And I certainly got better at it, but I hadn't become a star. So I got a job at Sony Cambridge. That was the end of 2006 and started working on lots of new uh, IPs. And that was that was a lot of fun pitching games. Um, and I did a bit of work on Little Big Planet PSP. There he is, and that's a, that's a special for today. That's a that's, that's you know. um, and and then after about five years, I saw there was it was the PlayStation. Um, this was yeah, 2010 uh, PlayStation 15th anniversary, and there were lots of talks at a big party at the O2, and I had a little ping moment because the talks weren't particularly engaging, let's say, and mm -hmm. maybe no names, but you know, I'll tell you if you ask. Uh, but the point is, I, I realized they needed the stuff that I learned from stand up that I wasn't using. They needed a concise talk with a story and they needed to sell the thing. They needed to be, you know, performing to some extent. They'd rehearsed it into the ground. Right. Yeah. So uh, I uh, went to work for Criterion for a year. I worked on Need for Speed Most Wanted and then set up on my own. So that was eight years ago. And this is what I do now. I coach people one to one and, and I help them with confident communication for all kinds of different situations. That's me, that's my background. Oh, excuse me. Brilliant, and, and do you like it? <laughs> I could, I was gonna spit it out there. Um, yes, no, I love it, I love it. I think, I, I think I can honestly say I've kind of, I think I've found my place in the world. I consider myself mostly an introvert. This fits, you know, I like to go and visit people and train people and help them because it's often it's a, a relatively easy job of pointing out well look you're really good at this and actually you know you're not as bad at this as you think and that's a lovely thing to be able to do and help people you know really progress and develop their skills um but also i get to do yeah bits of graphic design and make videos and i'm my own boss so <laughs> all yes. good two thumbs up Absolutely. but i've had to i've had to learn hello hello um hi Gemma. i've had to learn business you know you're in full-time employment for most of your life and you go oh wow here's here's accounting Oh, one has to do taxes Ta yeah get mm -hmm. someone else to do it anyway yeah so can you make taxes fun no you can make it easier or no no you just get someone else to do it get someone else to do it perfect but yeah um i think let's let's what are you what have you got to tell us what can you do to right oh right so i'm going to talk for i guess about 20 minutes actually about, I mean, it's called presentability, communicating with confidence. Typically the people I work with are doing presentations. They're standing up in front of people speaking or they're giving a presentation through this kind of format. So I've got, I've got with six sections. Uh, I wanna talk about showing confidence and controlling your nerves. I wanna talk about writing a rich, concise 
a piece of material with a story. I want to talk about engaging the audience, keeping their attention, communicating authentically, uh, visuals, because a lot of people feel that the presentation is a set of slides. So I'll deal with that. Mm-hmm. And finally, adapting to the unexpected, which I think is something, yes, um, is particularly relevant. So um, I'm going to kick off with showing confidence and controlling your nerves. I mean, this is the big one. This I could talk about this all day, but I think the key is showing confidence. The idea of fake it to make it, which you and I were talking about earlier on. If you send out the right signals, if when the talk, whatever it is, starts and you're smiling and you're making eye contact and you're looking right at the lens and you declare who you are and what you're going to talk about, I think that sends the right signals to the audience. So they then think, okay, um, well, you seem happy. Therefore, you probably know what you're talking about. You've probably done this before. This will probably be good. And you instill trust in them, which is what you want. So it's sending out those signals and it's setting up the the positive feedback loop where the audience then thinks, okay, yeah, I think I like you. I think I trust you. Good. And then you're away. And then they relax and they might then laugh at you for bits that you you talk about, uh, which you wanted to make them laugh. Um, And then you can see, yeah, they're happy and then you can relax and it's fine. If, however, that first impression is maybe negative, and it's not quite as strong as it should be, and maybe you aren't smiling because you think you have to be professional, then that can, that can sabotage things. Mm-hmm. But the showing the confidence, it's doing the, uh, uh, you know, sending out those signals is also for your own subconscious, because naturally, if you're gonna be speaking to people, you're gonna be nervous, that's a perfectly logical thing, but you send your subconscious all these signals. So if you watch um, Amy Cuddy's uh, TED talk, your body language may sh- shape who you are. They found that by standing or sitting in a particular way, so the Wonder Woman pose is a particularly good one, hands on hips, or people who've been blind since birth, when they win stuff, sometimes they'll throw their hands up in the air. So if you do that before your talk, not during, although if you can build it in, brilliant, uh, but you do it beforehand, it basically sends these signals that says, I'm happy with what I'm doing even if you're not. So the smile sends a signal that says, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying this, even if you're not. So it's embodying that great confident speaker that you want to be. And at the end of it, you might go, oh my God, amazing, I got away with it, you know, or, or, or it was a shambles, you know, wasn't that terrible? But the audience is going, yeah, it was really good. You, you obviously know your stuff, right? And you can, that's a trick. It's a trick that you can do every time. Um, that's great advice. So, oh, thank you very much. Oh yeah, and I'm, I'm no slides today. So you've got to write stuff down, <laughs> right? Or, you know, commit perfectly to memory, which I can't do. Um, so then it comes to the material, right? So, uh, you know, sometimes people say to me, oh, I don't feel confident if I don't know the material. I think, well, of course not, that, <laughs> you know, how could you? But creating good stuff, creating good material. Um, I think I found through creating countless bits of material and countless presentations, the best way is to say the words out loud, start by talking, mm. then capture those words. The benefit is that, it, first of all, you, you get used to saying the thing, right? So you're starting rehearsal immediately. Often people leave rehearsal until the last minute. Mm-hmm. But you get a better flow. You um, create words that have been spoken rather than have been written. And that might seem simple, but it's easy to write a piece that reads well. And then when you deliver it, it, it jars. You know, it doesn't, the word's going to fall out of your mouth. If you get used to saying the words, um, it, it will flow. It'll be better. And it also informs your writing. So I found... When you say the words out loud and you capture those, um, either with an audio recording or video, or use the word dictate software, which I found to be excellent. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you write good stuff. Sometimes you throw in a metaphor or a little phrase or a little thing. And, you know, and I've seen people do it where I've made them speak you know, off the cuff. And they come up with great stuff. You know, capture that, use it. Because once you've come up with something good off the cuff, that's yours forever. Right? So it's developing stuff in a, in a uh, a simple um, conversational way. So the other, there are many benefits, but one of the great benefits is it will tend to be more concise. And that's what we want. We want conciseness. Conciseness and simplicity rules, I think, for all communication. That email that's too long, no one's going to read it. Um, no one ever said, oh, I wish that presentation had gone a bit longer. Uh, you know, if, it's, if you've got a half hour slot and you develop your talk, let's say you, you do a quick, you know, writing, speaking session, and you come up with it, and you think, well, this is good, this covers everything, um, it's only eight minutes, brilliant, 
right? The, the idea, you know, the concept of, of the presentation is, is an idea. You want to get it to people's heads. And if you can do that simply and quickly, then that's brilliant. Uh, a story will do so much work, right? So I, I spoke at Women in Games in 2018 and I said, you know, stories are really important. And, you know, if you can tell your story and someone in the audience said, what if you don't have an interesting story? So I immediately came back with everyone's story is interesting. You know, it, it, your experience is unique. Your perspective is unique. It will be interesting. Um, and it doesn't have to be your story. It doesn't need to be that the whole thing is a story. But sharing stories is just very powerful. As a species, we are built for stories. We like a good story. Characters we can relate to, whether that's you or your team or your, your, you know, your players, encountering a problem and then overcoming it, it's just, it's exciting, it's engaging. So a good story, I find, humanizes data. It, it brings things yeah. to life. And if people are, you know, if people are, there's a series of people getting up and giving talks. It's a format, we're used to it. I'm gonna talk about something and I guess I've done it to some extent, although you let me tell my story at the beginning, so thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that works. But if you start off with no introduction, you just say, six months ago, this was happening. You know, these people were in this situation. Already I'm thinking, oh, right, what's this? You know, this is new and different. So stories are great. Um, and if you watch something, a TED talk like Ken Robinson's Do Schools Kill Creativity, he's, he's just brilliant and he throws in little stories. So that is a great way to engage people, which is my mm -hmm. next thing to talk about. Um, the list of stuff is informative. It's, in, it's information, it goes into our heads, but the story, that's fact with emotion. It's, it's an experience. And so I think to really engage an audience, there's making that good first impression, there's performing to some extent. So this is me sort of, you know, plus an extra 20%. Um, I don't always talk like this, uh, but it's, it's that way of engaging, which I, I really like, which is that human personal experience and, um, and asking questions. Oh yeah, yeah, go on. It creates a bond because I'm letting you, I'm telling you a secret or I'm giving you a, a behind the curtains look at me and something about me and that people can feel a, a genuine more connection, I guess, from that. Exactly. That's the, you know, that you have that unique experience, but probably with common elements like mm -hmm. your relationship with your family, your friends, food you like, things like that, where we go, oh yeah, me too. Or, you know, I don't know that, but I can relate to it. Exactly. Yes. And the connection, my God, like if you make a connection with your audience, then you're away, right? It's, it's a bit like that first impression, that trust. Mm -hmm. You can, you can get away with stuff later on, but I don't mean, you know, capitalize on that, but I mean, it, an audience will be more forgiving. You know, you trip up later on, they go, okay, well, it doesn't matter. We like you. Whereas, you know, if things haven't gone so well at the beginning, they go, okay, yeah, it's not working. Um, but I think, showing interest in the audience and you know that eye contact you know i i, I make a point of having i've got a, a webcam on a suspension arm and it's directly in front of my laptop so i can have a look at it so when i'm looking at the screen i'm looking there when i'm looking at my notes i'm looking there but it's not too far off if as i've seen lots you know you've got people giving talks because they've got another monitor it's mm -hmm. it's not it's not as good and i i know someone who, who did one they did two talks and the first one i said you're they were they're all over the place they were like this while they were talking, which said to me, nervous, which they were. Mm -hmm. And I said, you've got to look at the lens. And the next time they were like this and they were really, you know, on it. And I went, that's amazing. And he went, yeah, look. And he had a ring of blue tack that he put around his lens, <laughs> you know, or people have said they have like paper arrows and stuff. You know? Anyway, so that's I think really that's good. Nice. Yeah, it's, it, and, and it, fit, it can feel really unnatural looking at the lens. And I appreciate there are some, there are some Dells where they put it at the bottom of the screen bezel and stuff like that. Yeah. But if you can look at it and it's kind of at your height, your eye height, it, it works. Um, which leads me very neatly, it doesn't, um, to uh, communicating authentically. And I think that's, although no, it does, it does link that, that behind the scenes thing. Being authentic is probably the most powerful thing you can do, but I think it's probably the most difficult thing to do as well. So accepting your flaws, accepting who you are and being okay with them, that's really hard, but if you can do it, you create something wonderful. And Sharon said in, in her session about, you know, recognize it was that piece about recognizing your strengths and getting someone else to, to show you, look, you're brilliant at this. And 
particularly if, I don't know if it's if a British thing, but I think, oh, you know, we're, you're really good at this. And we go, oh, no, I'm not. Yeah. I will literally deny it, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's accepting that. So it's both things. So I mentioned the flaws, but also the strengths and being OK with those. That's I think that is just super powerful. So there's two, two ways I think it really works. I think the first is it's just more interesting. Mm -hmm. If you think you've got to be professional in inverted commas, which means no smiling and, you know, stiff and, and not moving your hands and um, I mean, you don't have to move your hands, but I like to do it. And being business like, I think you leave behind all that interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. And if, if when we see a speaker, when you see someone who appears to be comfortable in their own skin and they're just talking about what they love and that's that's lovely that that I feel makes it richer and way more engaging. But the other brilliant thing is it means you're free from that burden. You know, I, I, oh, I have to I have to impress them. I did. Well, how about you're just you. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, if someone says, oh, just be yourself, you go, I don't want to do that. <laughs> why? Why would I want to be myself? But it's more interesting. And being liberated from that is really good. So I when I set up this bookcase a while ago, I was populating with books. I thought, oh, you know, I must put good books on there. And I'd got all the, uh, the the comics and stuff. And, you know, I thought, oh, is that OK? You know, and I thought, I don't care. I'm at the point where I don't care. And I'm adding figures. I go, I don't care because I'll keep those up there. That's not just for today. I mean, that some of those are recent acquisitions, but they're going to stay there the whole time. And if people go, who the hell is that? Great. Conversation starter. Um, someone the other day noticed I'd got uh, Domu, which is an obscure, violent Japanese manga, <laughs> uh, which I haven't read for ages. And, and he went, oh, you've got that. That's really cool. And I thought, how do you eat? Well, first of all, I thought, how can you see it? But also, you know, mm -hmm. how, how do you eat it? Anyway, being you, being yourself, it's just, it's just better. It's more fun. And to be honest, if it cheeses someone off, good, right? You, it's, it's not for them. You know, oh, you've got a comic book figure up there. Uh, why would you do that? It's that's me. That's who I am. So it, but it's really hard. And I appreciate when you're trying to get a job, if you're trying, you know, you can't just walk in in a T-shirt and go, hey, I'm being me. But you can still be you in your style. And that's the other thing. It's, you know, I, I sometimes I say to people, you know, I want you to smile more. I want you to show more energy. And I've had pushback from that. They go, well, that, that's not me. And I think, good point. Mm -hmm. It needs to be you. So sometimes i ask people to do that to get more from them because i want to get more authenticity but of course if it's not going to be you or oh, i'm reading it as well um oh what um right it's a great question isn't it it's, well here's 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 my killer killer answer it's not killer. um if you can go into that situation being okay with not getting the job You'll probably come across written. Now, I, I appreciate it's a self-fulfilling thing. It's like, you know, I won't pray because I want, you know, I want to I get these things, but I don't want to have them. You know, uh, if you go in there, like, I'm not caring. I don't care about the job. I don't care about the job. I really want the job. But if you go in there having a conversation, just laid back and you're just you're going to talk to them. You're going to share your experience. You're going to tell them why you think you're brilliant. And that's fine. And they're either going to give you the job or they're not. If you don't stress about it and appreciate, easy to say, <laughs> slightly more difficult to do, but if you look relaxed and th that's, it's nicer for them. It says to them, well, you, you know, you're not super desperate, but also, I mean, they might start inferring, like, maybe you've got something else on the table. Oh, maybe we better snap you up. Like, if you, you seem really relaxed or it's like wearing, you know, nice, expensive clothes. Go, okay, things are going well for you. No, they're not. That's, you know, you've got an overdraft. But it's, so what I would say is it's, accepting yourself completely your audience whoever that is is looking for emotional guidance on how they should feel about whatever you're talking about so if someone throws you that killer question which leads me into another thing later on but in the interview and you don't know the answer if you respond with a big smile on your face first of all but with i've no idea that's great right if you say oh god you know i don't know or you know or even worse you start freestyling an answer credibility's gone down but mm -hmm. If you smile and go, I have absolutely no idea, it shows that you're OK with it. And, you know, and sometimes people ask tricky questions like that because they know you don't know the answer. So anyway, that's that's how I would do it. That's a short answer. But it's um, it's a, it's a state of mind. It's Zen, right? You, you go in going, I'm going to get the job or I'm not, but I, or not, but I'm going to talk to these people and, and mm -hmm. share ideas. with um, So in terms of I could talk about visuals and then adapting to the unexpected. So in terms of visuals, I think any 
talk, any presentation, it's an idea. It's a concept. It's a place you want to take people to. Mm -hmm. You want to get the idea into their heads. It might be a course of action you want them to take at the end of it, but you want to get the idea into their heads. If you can get the idea right into their heads with words alone, brilliant, right? You don't, now I appreciate a lot of people like to have a visual person. I do, I do like to have something just so I can get it. Or if I'm listening to a tour, I'll write stuff down. So I've got something to, to look at again. But if you rehearse your talk, do that first version that I was talking about where you're saying it out loud and it works, mm -hmm. Great, right? You'd, rather than starting with the slides, I think, well, the presentation is a series of slides and then I've got to um, talk them through it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's, I think you can look at it the other way around. I appreciate a really good visual with a brilliant image mm -hmm. or a killer st set of statistics or a, you know, a good graph or chart might get that information into their heads really well, but consider, do you need a slide for every part of it? Yeah. Where do you need a slide? Do you start with a killer slide and then get rid of it? Mm -hmm. Because if you do that, or if you, you start talking with no slides, particularly in person, people will think, oh, right, it's you. You're the, you're the medium for this. I'm and then aware. the slides are backing you up. We're all aware of death by PPT. And we've been in presentations where it doesn't matter if there's a presenter, you're actually just reading. And so images and visuals are really important, aren't they? Yeah. I, I mean, the, the point, you know, in theory, the point of the presentation is it's better when someone's speaking and taking you through the stuff. But I still see plenty of presentations where it's uh, it could stand alone. Right. It, mm -hmm. it supports itself. And in in a way, when someone talks me through that, I'm thinking, shush, I'm trying to read. You know, you've, you've created something that you could have emailed it to me the day before and saved us all a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a talk. And if you're ahead of the slides, if you say, you know, and that brings us to uh accountability and then the slide comes up you know then it's 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 not the and again this is something in person where you've got slides on a projector but i've done it where i turn around and i go oh and i appear to be surprised by my own slide which is not good you know you want to say what's coming up next and then it follows you mm -hmm. so yeah that there the, the visuals are there to back you up yeah. not the other way around um, and of course a visual could be a physical prop as well which is always good uh, so then the final thing I want to talk about is, is adapting to the unexpected. So things will go wrong, right? You'll give a talk and you'll feel odd about it. You'll feel really nervous. Somebody will ask a, uh, a tricky question. Uh, there'll be a technological issue of some sort. You'll have done something stupid. Um, you'll have a very itchy nose <laughs> earlier on. Oh my God. I, anyway, uh, unanticipated inconvenient things will happen. Go with it. Mm -hmm. right it's, you just have to go along smile in your face i've got the wrong notes these are the incorrect slides this is the wrong thing that it's creates a tension when something goes wrong you puncture the tension with hey that's you know that's like you know it's not that you don't care but you're going with it yeah and that i find gets a laugh like you can actually get a laugh so i know uh someone who gave a talk and uh it was a big games development audience he felt it was a bit flat he wasn't really they weren't really going for it the low battery warning on his laptop came up on the screen like big flashing <laughs> thing they all laughed right someone else's misfortune haha <laughs> you're getting it wrong right and they loved him after that because he was a human being i totally a... agree um as you know teaching i've always thought if you if you tell a joke first if someone laughs with you they're on your side yeah they laugh at you well that's it yeah that, that that's why i find that the you know jokes are one thing but you know humor is just that going with it kind of zen mm -hmm. zen style yeah so to to just cover those main points then just think of that confidence i find is that first impression um when it comes to controlling your nerves oh actually this is an additional thing everything accelerates right so slowing down mm -hmm. you know nice deep breath remind yourself while you're there what's going to happen if you say the words out loud you'll get something that flows that it's concise throw in a story at least one and you'll have something that is really engaging for people um being interested in the audience i think is really good so i can't stop looking at the chat but i have to stop looking at the chat uh <laughs> You know, but just being interested in, in that interaction is really good. Asking questions, mm -hmm. being yourself, 
huge challenge. You know, it's a, it's a constant journey. You know, I'm still on it. You're you're still trying to find out who you are and like what you're going to show to people. But if you can do it, I think sometimes you'll find, particularly if you're kind of confessing to things, you know, I messed this up recently. You'll find other people. Oh God, me too, right? Mm -hmm. And then and that's how you get that that connection. In terms of visuals, try it with nothing and see what happens. That might sound a bit silly, but you know, try running through it and just see. Is there anything I have to have? Because if you don't need it, then you can be liberated from mm -hmm. that. Uh, and finally, go with the flow, which is more zen of something went wrong. Somebody did something unexpected. Laugh, you know, laugh in a nice way, not laugh at it, but, you know, laugh along with it and, mm -hmm. and go with it. And that way I find you'll do a great presentation. Excellent. So you, you mentioned there about um, the laughter. How, how do yeah. you be funny? And can you tell me that in one sentence or less? How can I be funny? I think it's it's the things I've already mentioned. It's being okay with yourself and seeing the, the ridiculousness of, of something going wrong. Just going with the flow. The uh, the Eisenhower quote I like. Sorry, this isn't one, one sentence. Uh, Eisenhower quote is, is uh, I've always found planning to be essential, but plans to be useless, right? So Consider everything you might need. Consider anything you want to do. But on the day, just go with it. For mm -hmm. God's sake, don't try and stick to a super rigid sequence because it won't happen. You go along, yeah, okay, missed a bit out there. Jump to this bit. The audience doesn't know. Great. Mm -hmm. It's, it's yeah, it's just going with it. And and you also, in your talks, you do mention about embracing the weird, particularly. <laughs> yeah. Effective. So I think, I guess I think I'm weird and and other people are normal and then i meet someone else who's weird and, and we get on really well so i think it's it's just more interesting you know if you if you want to stand out particularly when getting a job you know i know someone who said they always wear like bright red clothes and they go for an interview and it works i thought that's nuts but it you know it works um it's accepting who you are and letting the audience see that in a nice way you you're okay with all of that and that's that's lovely you know if you if you're in a, a group of 10 candidates for a job and you know you're the least qualified but everyone else is you know maybe a bit too keen to get the job or you know they don't socially it doesn't quite work and you're just going yeah i'm i'm fine with who i am and like you seem a nice group of people i'd like to work here you'll probably get it because they just think i like you they'll find reasons you know they'll find reasons in your cv and go oh they've done this and this because it's, it's the connection and the other thing that you you have referred to quite a lot in your work is the fact that you're an introvert who utilizes extrovert skills that's interesting. I yeah so I thought I was an extrovert because I like talking loud and, and sort of showing off even though at school you know but not at all confident and I would I would stand up to read things but I you know I've always felt intellectually sort of inferior and and then I met someone a few years ago who pointed out it's about how you recharge right so it's how you get your your energy and I thought oh now it makes sense mm -hmm. like I I have to be on my own for, <laughs> for long periods of time I'm married with kids what was I thinking um and it's that's how I that's how I sort of get back to where I need to be. But by throwing myself into doing stand up, you know, I've learned those techniques, which are basically a little bit of improvisation and sort of reading what's going on. Like I'm sort of easily distracted. Right. So I can kind of, you know, read what's going on. So, yeah. I, but what I would definitely say is if you consider yourself to be mostly an introvert, because we're never 100 percent one or the other that shouldn't affect your ability and i know it doesn't affect your ability to communicate it may even make you more interesting as a communicator so don't think oh well that person is you know seems to be great at speaking they're great at interacting doesn't matter i've, I've worked with plenty of people who are uh, are used to their extroverts extroverts they're used to interacting they rely on the winging it mm -hmm. and it goes wrong because they don't they don't rehearse they don't, they don't write decent material so yeah mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that was actually my son coming in to talk to me there, so embracing... Oh, excellent, good. Go. Good, yeah, I've heard a noise here as well. Um, so we've got a question from Kat Parker, and it's it's a good one. Um, she's saying they've struggled with, and still struggle with, so they found it hard to be authentic presenting in the past, when the mentor at the time was so much more extroverted, and it was, it was to match the level of someone else. You've got someone who's like, yeah, wow! and you're kind of like yeah, yeah. I, so i i did a talk at develop a few years ago and i was saying hey you know do this do that and someone else went what if we're not animated like you john <laughs> <laughs> i was like oh ah yeah um i think hang on so what's the question is about being authentic sorry hold on I, how to, how i've to derailed myself and how to because they find that 
matching the level. Yes, sorry, no, that was it. It was the, yeah. So that's the thing. So I, I like to do it in a particular way because I found after years of doing stand up that basically the more you perform, or at least the more I performed, the literally the better the laugh. So you'd get a better bit of interaction. But no, it's got to be you. It's got to be your style. If you're absolutely so, the other end of the spectrum, there's a comic called Stephen Wright, who would just he had amazing material. Right, he's the, he's the radio DJ in mm -hmm. Reservoir Dogs, and he's very dry. He's got killer material, right? Um, if you looked at someone like uh, I know Jimmy Carr is, is is not everyone's cup of tea, but uh, anyway, um, you know he's all about the the purely from a writing point of view. He's all about. Uh, writing short bits of you know yeah. jokes like the science of the jokes lee evans on the other hand it's you know 100 and whatever percent performance right and you could argue his material isn't that strong but it doesn't matter because he's a phenomenal performer so it's whatever your style is and it's basically it's a leap of faith you know you you basically you do it you try that new thing and you go oh god this isn't going to work and then when it does work that's yours that's that little thing that you do where you talk about uh, your appearance or your name or something that, so I've got cat hair everywhere it's unbelievable they started melting you have no idea it's like this it's like a magnet for, for cat. um just find it everywhere um where you know, just to say where you, you know you take that it's taking the risk but you you I think you'll find that people will really enjoy it and they'll relate to you definitely and I think maybe like you don't need to worry about balancing because two people that are very high voltage can be quite tiring and if you think about a lot of comedy partnerships, you've got the full guy and you've got the straight guy. And that relationship actually balances out to one normal person. <laughs> yes, no, that's it. Exactly. And what I would say is, let's say someone has gone on before you at a talk and they're, you know, loads of energy and you mm -hmm. just think, oh, God, there's nowhere I can compete. You shouldn't compete. You should go completely the other way. You know, if someone's really, you know, ripped it, they, they've, you know, they, they've, use lots of energy and the audiences love them and they've been applauding or whatever you need to walk on and just stand there and smile at everyone and just wait until it's all died down wait till you hear a pin drop and say i'm going to talk to you about accountability and just let it hang you know just i'm going to do this and now you've completely brought it down mm -hmm. um so when you know it's like when someone's really killed it at a comedy club that's what you'd need to do likewise if it's gone very flat you need to come on and go yay <laughs> But it's it's contrast. So yeah, it it should be your your style. And if you're if you are really really quiet, and uh, let's say a, a mentor or someone said, hey, yeah, do lots of energy, and you don't, good for you. It's like the person who said to me, no, I'm not going to smile more. I'm <laughs> that's that's not what I do. I'll, okay, as long as it's you, that's the that's the thing. Well, we have um, Marnie Lewis here is saying, um, what about Toastmasters for practice? Ooh. I've only been to a couple of those. I went to one in Guildford years ago. From what I can see, it's excellent, but it could be really slow. So I think, you know, you might get a chance to speak for a couple of minutes once every week or whatever, mm. but it's got a, you know, that military hierarchy. It looks pretty good. So I think I remember seeing some brilliant speakers actually who are improvising and doing lots of good stuff. So I think it can be really good, but it might take a while. So maybe use that, but then in between go and get as much it's all about experience mm -hmm. right you've got to get as much experience as you can you know if you're learning anything you can do a crash course you do it every day for a week you'll be as good as if you did it you know for an hour every day for you know a few months so uh, or arguably better so I, I would definitely go and try it out see what you think but if you find it's taken three hours for you to get that one minute <laughs> it might not be as useful maybe it's good for networking or better that's, Mary that's Claire is actually asking if, if who's that? <laughs> Mary Claire Iceman. I don't know. She's someone that's been around, some, some around today all, all day. Anyway, asking questions and whatnot. Um, when you work with clients, what is the process? When I work with, sorry. When you work with clients, what's the process? Yeah. So you mentioned that you do one to one. Oh, I see. What is that? I tell you what, very first thing um, is we have a phone call to see if we get on together. You know, I just give them a get out of jail free, right? It's just like, we'll have a chat mm -hmm. and and just see what happens. But then it's basically getting people to speak. You know, the best way to learn how to do something is to get them to do it. So I like to find out what people are about, what motivates them, and then tackle whatever it is. If it's general confidence, then just speaking is good. Mm -hmm. uh, having a particular piece to work on, I really like, because then we can look at the writing and performance but a lot of it does come down to self-acceptance. And uh, it's 
as I, uh, I think I mentioned before, that I have this lovely privilege, which I've given myself of being able to point out to people, actually, you're OK. You know, you're not terrible at this. Yeah, maybe there's room for development, but mm -hmm. you came across well. And sometimes that's, there's often a great disparity between how people see themselves and how they actually come across. And so sometimes I'll ask someone, you know, it's, it's gone fine. Like they've come across quite well. I go, how was that? And they go, oh, it's terrible. You know, and they'll, they'll say, I'm dreadful at this. And then me and some other people will say, no, it was fine. <laughs> You're good. Yeah, there's a few things. Yeah, maybe you did a few erms. But... So I find getting people to actually do the speaking is really good. But yeah, generally there'll be a, a, some kind of structure. But we, we will determine that in our, in our first session. Is there any interpretive dance element? I do a lot of that um, and I'm really it's frustrating actually that via um, Zoom or whatever platform that you know I have to <laughs> you should always be Leo uh, ready <laughs> oh. so no there's no interpretive dance but hey whatever Something hey if you're if you're my client we can do that <laughs> something to think about for the future there um, mm. so Ode, and I hope I'm saying your name right, Ode, um, is saying that she once had to follow a, communica uh, a commun communication coaching session for work, and she felt horribly bad as the coach tried to push her out of her boundaries systematically um, to yeah. teach her how to react, so purposely putting someone in a bad situation in order to mm. get them to react to it. And the dimension of being authentic is completely different from what they try to teach them. So she's saying that your way seems better. Oh, thank God. I thought you were saying their way was far more efficient. No, no, I, I don't think she's very happy. I'm always looking for the, for, the, for the bad aspect. So, okay. So from my experience, and I've had people get in touch before a session and say, look, I'm really nervous. Mm -hmm. I don't think I want to do this. And of course, I'd say to them, look, I'm not going to get you to do anything you don't want to do. The, again the joy is I just you know metaphorically just nudge people say just get up and speak for a minute mm -hmm. and then afterwards typically you know their response will be well it wasn't as bad as I thought but also hey everyone else is nervous which is a lovely you know bit of connection to have so uh, in theory if you're pushed out of your comfort zone you then enter your learning zone but that doesn't mean you then have to be horribly uncomfortable mm -hmm. so I mean I have I suppose I have had people who've yes they've refused to do it and I'm going to push them as much as I can because I know if they do it, it'll be fine. But obviously I can't, um, you know, not make them feel unhappy. Generally, there's a lovely journey that happens mm -hmm. where people you know, really transform. And of course, the more worried they are about it, the more fantastic they feel when they sit down after a couple of minutes and we go, that was awesome. And they go out of body experience, completely odd. Mm -hmm. um, so teaching you how to react. Yeah, I. I think it's, yeah, it all comes back to getting experience. You know, every, even if it's just a minute in front of the team talking about something, take that opportunity and try something new. If it goes wrong, doesn't matter. If it works, that's yours. You know, that's that little thing to try out. So Definitely. trying things out, taking risks, getting experience is terrifying, but it's so worth it. And you, and you can't outrun it forever as well. No, You're going to have to do it at some point. Sorry. I 100% agree with you there. So, if we're if we're going to take that interpretive journey, and I wish the world mm. was involved in this now, um, when it does go wrong, so as a stand-up mm. comic, when you have died on stage, what do you do? Right. So the the one I like to I don't like to tell, but the one I tell people about is Rawhide Liverpool. First couple of minutes not working. I'm booked to do twenty minutes, and I stick it out for the twenty minutes. And something even more sinister than being yelled at happens, which is you become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So you're on stage with a microphone and a spotlight and there's however many people, I can't remember, a lot just talking. <laughs> so so that's a special edifying process. But basically you keep going. So in that particular scenario, I, I had to keep going because I've been paid to do it and it's better because you otherwise you mess up the, the whole show. And then when you finish, you know, they go, okay, you were rubbish, but at least, you know, you stuck it out and fair play to you. However, in a um, in a speaking scenario, I've had people like falter mm -hmm. and, and this is in, you know, in a talk where I've just been present or in a session I'm doing, they fold and they go, no, sorry. And they've, they've bailed and I've gone, hold on, it's fine, keep going. Mm -hmm. Now, again, that might sound like a, a, being a horrible bullying uh, coach, but the point is I'm basically going, it's OK, like we're all fine with it. And, and what it does is they actually it's not that I keep them going it's actually they reset. So they take a moment. 
maybe even start again, mm -hmm. sip of water, stop, and then it kind of lets the energy flow out of them a bit and then they get back into it. And then typically, you know, if I can get them to do that, I think people have always done it, then it's it's way better. So yeah, if it's really faltering, you can actually just, just stop. Sorry, everyone, I need to stop. Mm -hmm. Rather than just leaving the venue or, you know, the stage is go stop for a minute, right, let's let's go again. And maybe not start at the beginning, maybe resume, mm -hmm. but just give it a give it a moment because it can spiral. You know, you can get something wrong and then it feels like you've got this momentum of failure and all you have to do is kind of get off the bus. Do you know what I mean? Just sort of get off the roundabout and stop for a minute. I don't know what metaphor I'm using there. Uh, and then get back on and go, right, here we go. Let's get back into it. Because honestly, the audience I find in most scenarios, it, in a nice way, they don't really care. They're just going, yeah, it's all right. We're just, you know, we want to watch you. There's not, there's not half as much riding on it for them as there is for you. Definitely. Um, so I don't know if we have any more questions in the chat. If anyone has any more questions, you can feel free to drop them in the chat and I will voice them upon John. Um, so when you, I keep coming back to this embrace the weird because it's, it's just an ethos that I totally, totally abide by. Um, what is the weirdest thing? Of what? You'll have to be more specific. What do you mean? Well, you're saying embrace the weird, so like the in terms of oh. presentation style. Oh, I see. Or um, presentation action. Oh, I did, well, uh, Reggie Watts's TED Talk, Beats That Defy Boxes. That is well worth looking at. So that's just a performance piece. It's brilliant. He subverts TED a little bit. But there's moments in there where he'll do, like there's a bit where he uses like um, a loop pedal and he's singing and rapping and and doing weird voices. He starts off talking in like a uh, Spanish, then English, then you know, um, or he, I think it's it may even be like a fake language. Anyway, um, but there's points in there where he does something, and I'm thinking that this is a real performer where it's funny, but I'm pretty sure that he did that perfectly prepared for it to to fail. So he does a bit where he's just about to do a, a performance bit. And he just does a kind of actor's lunge, like a stretch. And you go, yeah, that still works. And it gets a laugh. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, you know, it's funny in that scenario. In another one, it wouldn't be funny at all. So that's weird where he's just, and I'm thinking, is this audience into this? Because, you know, you see shots of the audience. I think there's a lot of people there who I imagine are going, this is not what we signed up for. Mm -hmm. Like we wanted an intellectual scientific breakthrough. We want to feel good. But, you know, I love it because he's being funny and he's, yeah, he's, slightly ridiculing ted so he does deliberately long sentences that make no sense which is very funny um so i think that's weird especially because it's in a place where you know you've got to be absolutely um you know you've got to have something compelling mm -hmm. um which I, and I, I guess overall if you look at it yes he's kind of saying be yourself but he doesn't say that explicitly at all <laughs> well thank you very much is there anything else you would like to add yourself i don't think so, because any one of these topics I could go off for <laughs> hours about. But I'd like to say thank you very much. I really appreciate you helping me out and guiding me a little bit. Um, and thank you to Women in Games.